Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. Uh, this is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. Uh, we have a special guest this evening, uh, Karen Rodman. Uh, before that, we're going to do a bit of a news roundup and a, a video clip. I am speaking to you from uh, Jojage, which has uh, long been a meeting point of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. And I have a funny little short, funny little clip about Trudeau, Haiti that I'll start off with. Haitians themselves need to be at the center of building stability and a long-term future for Haiti. Uh, we cannot continue to see uh, external elements, no matter how well-meaning, uh, try to determine the future of <coughs> Haiti the same day. Uh, regional partners like CARICOM uh, and uh, global partners like Canada, US, uh, France, Europe, European Union and others uh, have an extremely important role to play as well. The Haitians themselves need to be at the center. So that's just a uh, brief little clip that uh, Dan Cohen did on uh, on uh, Trudeau and uh, the hypocrisy. Um, the most obvious hypocrisy of Trudeau's comment at the UN uh, a week or 10 days ago was that there's a really simple solution to what he's saying, which is for Canada to withdraw from the core group of countries that that, you know, basically dictate Haitian affairs and that selected Ariel Henry as, as the leader of the country through a tweet. Uh, so, so um, you know, if a campaign to force Trudeau to live up to his, uh, his, um, his words, at least the initial words, uh, is, a, is something that, that we should uh, pursue. And the demonstrations in Haiti are ongoing, still major demonstrations, uh, urban areas uh, shut down. And uh, so the, the mass uprising continues uh, in that country. Uh, elsewhere, where there's been major protests that get a whole lot more attention than the protests against Canadian US policy in Haiti, of course, is in Iran. And there have been uh, significant protests in Iran. And to a certain extent, I think maybe a slightly lesser extent, they, they still are going on. Uh, and uh, today, the Trudeau government announced uh, sanctions, a list of 34 entities and individuals, Iranians, uh, entities and individuals that will be sanctioned uh, associated with the, with the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard, the morality police. And uh, four or five days ago on uh, CBC Power and Politics, uh, Vasi Capel or Capellos or however you pronounce her name, uh, had a remarkable panel with uh, essentially about Iran and mostly about Iran, but 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 really had a broader uh, foreign policy kind of discussion. She had a representative from the, the Liberals. She had uh, Melissa Latzman, who's the deputy leader for the new deputy leader for the Conservatives, and Heather McPherson from the NDP. And it was to discuss what to do about Iran. And everyone is agreement that we have to be more hard line on Iran. That was, uh, everyone was agreeing with that. Uh, uh, Capellos asked twice of the liberal whether they support, quote, support their call for regime change. So the liberal kind of demurred on that question. And then she asked again, do you support the call for regime change? And so the liberals weren't willing to openly commit to that. And nor was Heather McPherson. Of course, the conservative representative, Melissa Latzman, was uh, quite aggressive. She was like, yes, we support regime change. And he, she said, quote, if you can't be unequivocal about a brutal religious dictatorship who kills their own people, then I'm not sure what we're all discussing here. Now, there's an obvious response to that, which is the fact that Canada doesn't just have diplomatic relations with Iran's neighbor, Saudi Arabia, that is more repressive and and uh, and more patriarchal than Iran. That we we actually sell them weapons, and they've been our big, second biggest recipient of Canadian weapons over the past 
handful of years. Um, so it's an incredibly hypocritical from just to compare Canadian policy to other countries in the region. Also, if you go back and you look in a history and you find that Canada supported uh, the Shah right till the end, very close relations with the Shah right until 79, uh, significant business relations, po politicians regularly going to Iran, uh, even security arrangements, weapon sales, and Canada played a small part, passively uh, supported the 1953 ouster of, uh, of uh, Mossadegh after he nationalized, opposed his nationalization of oil. And so the Canadian policy is incredibly hypocritical, just if you look at it compared to other countries in the region today. And, and if you take a bit of a historical lens, it's also a, uh, you know, Canada doesn't care about human rights in Iran or democracy in Iran. Canada cares about geopolitical, uh, primary, primarily geopolitical uh, kind of questions. Now, in the interview, what makes this, this CBC interview so remarkable was to see what like the oppositional kind of policy was. So McPherson uh, does, she doesn't say we support regime change, but she says, she basically criticizes uh, the liberals on Ukraine. And so they're saying, well, well, we, we can sanction all we want in Iran. She calls for more sanctions in Iran. We can sanction all we want, but if we're not, you know, sort of serious about enforcing these sanctions, uh, how much does it matter? And she brings up the, the question of Ukraine and she cites a figure saying that Canada actually only has only seized, I think she's like $130 million in Russian assets as part of the sanctions against Russia. So she's sort of saying that like, just, you know, basically we're not tough enough on, on the Ukraine question as she's sort of like holding back on this, like, you know, open support for regime change in Iran. Um, but it just it just sort of speaks to this the the ethos of Canadian political life, and and in in her comments, McPherson points out we got to listen to Iranians. We got to do we got to do what's effective, and we got to listen to Iranians. Now, if you are serious about as an internationalist, if you're serious about being effective, and I think it's something we should be serious about, you of course would not be focused on Iran whatsoever. You would be focused on Haiti where Canada is the, you know, number two player, where there are mass protests calling for the removal of the Canadian US imposed leader, right? We don't have that much influence in Iran. All kinds of reasons for that. Um, so, so if you were serious about influence and being effective, you would focus on Haiti. And, 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 and Heather McPherson, of course, never says anything about Canada's role in Haiti. Um, Secondarily, she says we have to listen to Iranians. I bet if you polled Iranians, you find that 80% of Iranians, maybe even higher, want diplomatic, don't oppose Canada breaking off diplomatic relations with Iran, oppose Canadian sanctions against Iran, and oppose Canada listing Iran as a state sponsor of terror. Certainly, if you're not going to be, if you're not going to be listing the IDF, you're not going to listen to the American military, or quite frankly, the Canadian military, as a state sponsor of terror. You certainly shouldn't be, you shouldn't be uh, uh, listing, um, you know, Iran shouldn't be considered a state sponsor of terror if you're not considering those other countries. In fact, I, I, I get into a little bit of a, a nuance about how that listing works, but nonetheless, so so. If we, if we were serious about listening, listening to Iranians, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't seen polling, but I would be astounded if the majority of Iranians weren't opposed to Canada breaking off relations, opposed to sanctions, uh, et cetera. But, but that's not, uh, you know, that's not what Heather McPherson is really, really, uh, uh, you know, concerned about. Uh, she's concerned about what, what actually, when she says listen to Iranians, what she's actually sort of referring to is listening to a segment of the Iranian community in Canada. And there was a big demonstration there. The, the organizers are saying 50,000 in Richmond Hill, just outside of Toronto. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm doubtful it was actually 50,000, but it was clearly a big demonstration. You can see the photos, thousands, tens of, maybe even tens of thousands uh, on Saturday. And they, the, the clearly there's like you know some left wing like I, I saw that Spring Magazine, which is a you know a good left wing publication. I saw a tweet from them 
uh, sort of promoting the demonstration. So there's there's and and people online, other people online who are you know frame you know consider themselves leftists and whatever were were supporting this demonstration. And and there's a lot of interesting things. First of all, we should be clear that the demonstration did call for listing the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, as a terrorist organization. And that has like massive implications because it's such a, a large institution. It have major implications for people to um, come to Canada, immigrate to Canada, even if you were like a cook in, in the Islamic Revolutionary Guard 20 years ago that could theoretically block you from being able to come here or, or get status and that, that, that and, and the like. So, so that's, it sounds like internally part of why they're not doing it is for that reason is, is that it's just the, to actually enforce it would be very difficult and the sort of the far reaching nature of, of doing so goes beyond the, the explicit political objective that would be sort of sought in, in doing so. Um, but the demonstration called for that in, in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, and and to me, one of the things that really showed that, that what the, you know, the demonstration is really about was that the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs tweeted out about it. Michael Levitt tweeted out about it. All of the top Toronto-based, at least, um, uh, Israel lobby groups were just gleeful about this demonstration and they were just, you know, tweeting all, on about it. And, and it, it ra rather than something that be, that's, you know, standing in solidarity with, with women in Iran who are, who are facing, um, uh, you know, sexist uh, policies, uh, the effect of it is to strengthen the forces with, within Canadian political life that are calling for more sanctions that are calling for, <laughs> Uh, you know, calling for regime change, and and that's not that's not going to be helping Iranians. It's not going to help <clears throat> Iranian self determination, and you know, at its macro, could lead to something really you know really horrible, as we've seen in the regime change, Western led regime change efforts in Libya, Iraq, uh, efforts uh, you know failed effort in, in in Syria and 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 elsewhere. Um, there's an element that I think is very fascinating. I don't know how much you get into it. It's worth probably getting into it in at some point. The whole diaspora question and how diaspora communities become tools of, <clears throat> of imperialistic Canadian foreign policy. There's <clears throat> sort of two ways to look at that. One way to look at it is that is Canadian political culture on international affairs so, ro <clears throat> so rotten, so pro-corporate, so pro-empire, so, so racist and colonial <clears throat> that you can't basically operate as a diaspora, as a, as a mainstream diaspora community organization and not take on those values, right? Like there's obvious ways in which it plays out, which is that the, you know, the dominant media only gives the voice to members of the diaspora communities or organizations of diaspora communities that say what the Canadian government wants. Right, or say what they want to hear, right? The sort of dominant political ethos. <clears throat> and I've seen that play out in the Haitian community here in Montreal just over and over and over again, where the voices that are bigged up by uh, Radio Canada and the, the major media are the voices that are align with uh, Canadian policy in Haiti. But also, I think we're seeing that, you know, the, the, the mobilization, of course, draws, uh, you know, draws people are, 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 emboldened to take to the streets when they know they're taking to the streets within a political culture that is supportive of a, going to a protest saying, you know, down with the regime in Iran or, or you know, sanction the, the, um, the Islamic Revolution and Guard Corps or, you know, that just goes in the, in the direction of, of where, where the protest is, uh, is going politically. Um, <clears throat> but, it, but it becomes sort of deep-seated in, in how the whole whole like diaspora <clears throat> a community uh, organizations function, and uh, and you see that here in, in, in Montreal with the like the Maison d'Haïti, which is a you know they would frame themselves as a sort of like progressive feminist certainly anti racist uh, uh, organization, and and I think they are when it comes to their domestic operations. Uh, but the uh, Marjorie Villefranche, the, the head of the Maison d'Haïti, a couple of days ago, a week ago, she's quoted in Le Devoir saying 
kind of actually saying sort of something similar to what Trudeau was saying was that on one hand, uh, you know, foreign forces are, are doing bad things in Haiti because now everyone agrees that the foreign influence in Haiti has been a disaster. And then simultaneously saying that Canada is in, you know, perfectly positioned to take the lead in Haiti. Uh, um, and and, and uh, there's all kinds of funding, you know, they get the funding from the Canadian government and so there's funding elements that help explain how the diaspora institutions become uh, subservient to the overarching political uh, foreign policy ethos, um, but that's a very interesting, interesting kind of kind of kind of question. And you see that with you know with the I think the Chinese community is one of in some ways is one of the more fascinating. Obviously, it's a huge community, very diverse. But but the there was a couple conservative MPs that appear to have lost their seats in part. Three MPs that lost their seats in part because the Chinese community had had switched two of them in Richmond, Vancouver, uh, you know, suburb of Vancouver, and uh, and one of them in uh, outskirts of Toronto. And and those those Chinese community voices, so this is, you know, the, the community that had been vo voting conservative. So obviously, you know, generally a sort of conservative right-leaning kind of community. And that and that they they uh, none of their voices get to be in the media. Uh, so you don't actually hear from the, these Chinese community, even though there, there's clearly, you know, the, the data suggests that a lot of them did switch their vote from the conservatives to the liberals. They, they have sort of no place within or very little place within the dominant media. Um, uh, so there's some interesting dynamics with the, with the uh, Chinese community. But I think the, the main point that, that, that people in general need to grapple with, or I, I certainly grapple with and, and I'm trying to flush out a bit, is this idea of like, is Canadian foreign policy so imperialistic, so racist, so pro-corporate, colonial, that, that diaspora communities basically, basically have to become subservient to it? Uh, now, obviously, you know, the main opposition to Canada's role in Haiti came from the Haitian community, right? So, so the diaspora community is also, you know, the most organized and the most knowledgeable and the most committed on the other side as well, right? That, you know, demonstrations where there was, you know, uh, the biggest one here in Montreal was like 400 people opposing the, the coup on the one year anniversary of the coup, 400 people from the Haitian community, almost no one from outside of the Haitian community. Um, uh, but um, but but so yeah so there's that, that there's an interesting dynamics and that's a question that I think we're seeing play out a bit with the with the Iran uh, with the Iran uh, question going on now. A couple quick things uh, just wanted to mention uh, stories. There's a uh, good story in Passage titled "Toronto Star Deletes Palestine After Complaint from Israel Lobby," basically showing how the Toronto Star took the word Palestine out of an article multiple times after Honest Reporting Canada complained. Uh, There's a story on Canada Files <clears throat> about, uh, I think published yesterday, about uh, the Canadian government's assistance to uh, Centura Gold for its uh, operations in, in uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, after they were nationalized. And this company that's been in huge fight, ecological battle, battle over royalties with the government. And uh, and there's um, <clears throat> the Canadian government, even after it's nationalized, appears to have been channeling assistance uh, uh, in a way that supports uh, the company's uh, operations uh, in that country. Another article that was just published on Jacobin titled Canada is cheerleading Na new NATO expansion, talking about Canada's at the forefront of pushing uh, Sweden <clears throat> and Finland joining NATO which is historically, you know, fits because Canada was at the forefront of pushing NATO expansion east, uh, even without a, even even without even having debate in Parliament, uh, just by order in Council. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's you know obviously part of Canada's contribution to ratcheting up tensions with uh, with Russia uh, 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 over uh, Ukraine and uh, Eastern Europe. There was a victory in the, the struggle for uh, Palestinian rights this, uh, this week, that yeah, was announced this week, um, a private prosecution was, uh, was allowed to be moved forward, was okayed by a justice of the peace uh, regarding Sorel. Sorel is a Toronto-based, Sorel Canada is a Toronto-based organization that 
that uh, basically brings uh, Canadians, about 150 a year, to volunteer on Israeli military bases to do non-combat uh, functions on the bases, including things like stocking uh, tanks and just maintaining the base. Uh, it's part of a broader Sarel network uh, in Israel and internationally. And the Israeli military has said it saves them like $14 million or something like that a year. And the Canadian Foreign Enlistment Act says that you can't, you can't recruit uh, <clears throat> non-combat or combat for foreign militaries to assist foreign militaries. And uh, there is a uh, uh, dossier of evidence around Sorel uh, compiled and uh, was sent to the uh, Toronto police, sent to the government. They didn't act. So there was a private prosecution uh, brought forward that the justice of the peace, basically a judge, uh, agreed deserved to be deserved to be heard, and so this is effectively in November, Sorel will have to plead, presumably they'll plead not guilty, uh, to the charges, and then a uh, a legal uh, battle will 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 ensue, um, and potentially they could be found uh, to be contravening the Foreign Enlistment Act. And uh, this is a big, this is, you know, a step, an important step. I mean, it's modest at one level, but an important step forward for this broader campaign that's been going on for two years around uh, opposing foreign rec recruitment in Canada. Now, Sorel is not bringing people into be soldiers for the Israeli military, but there are other institutions in this country that have been pretty openly, uh, United Jewish Appeal, uh, the Israeli consulate basically trying to get Canadians to join uh, the Israeli military in probable violation of the Foreign Enlistment Act. Uh, and there's a whole network of like, you know, Jewish uh, schools in Toronto and Montreal that, that whether they, they seem to be in trying to induce the Foreign Enlistment Act says inducement, uh, uses the word inducement uh, to a foreign military. And they, I would say pretty clearly seem to be inducing uh, grade 12s, grade 11s uh, uh, to, to consider joining the Israeli military. Um, so, so the Sorrell case kind of opens up this, this broader uh, uh, question that, that's been, been raised and the police have, and the government has refused to act on over the past two years. So this is a, this is a, a, a small but, but concrete victory step forward uh, for this uh, for this campaign and that gets me to uh, to our guest uh, this evening uh, Karen Rodman who is the uh, the, the head of uh, just peace advocates who is uh, you know one of the most important uh, Palestine solidarity groups in the country and uh, uh, I've been Karen's part of the uh, the group that's been working on the foreign enlistment uh, question. Uh, I really got to know Karen well in the campaign against um, Canada's bid for a seat on the United Nations Security Council. She uh, she was uh, played a, a central role, really instigated the whole looking at Canada's voting record at the UN on Palestine over the past 20 years, which which was used to uh, to good effect in that campaign, and also getting the uh, getting the emails of all the UN ambassadors. Uh, so we, you know, flooded, we got like 1300, whatever the number was, people emailing like the, you know, the ambassador for, uh, I don't know, if it's Turks and Caicos uh, around opposing Canada's bid for the Senate you know, Security Council, we'd sent on a number of different issues a Palestine related one, a general one, a Caribbean related one, a, a Africa related one. And, 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 you know, I think, I don't know, we don't know this for sure, but, but like a lot of these ambassadors don't get that many emails uh, you know, small country UN uh, representative, not necessarily getting that many emails on the issue. So you, you pump in like thousands of emails from Canadians saying vote against Canada for the Security Council. Uh, we think that had a had an effect. Uh, it was certainly the Canadian government <laughs> basically told us that they, they didn't mean to tell us. They 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 circulated documents internally that that suggested that the on the Palestine question we were having a big effect. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, and Karen's, of course, uh, as anybody who has done uh, good work on Palestine has 
come under a specific attack from uh, B'nai B'rith and, uh, and others in, in that world. Um, so I thought I'd have Karen on to talk a bit about uh, some of what Just Peace Advocates is doing and some of, uh, some of her, uh, her uh, activism and, and trajectory. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming on, Karen. Well, and uh, I guess my first question will just be, you know, how did you get involved in, uh, in Palestine uh, solidarity activism? Thanks, Eve. Uh, first of all, let me just say I'm joining from uh, the area of Kortha Lakes, which is under the Williams Treaty, uh, the home of Mississauga, Haudenosaunee, and the Ashanabee, um people. Um, and I'm really honored to be here and really honored to uh, uh, work with Eve and Bianca and those at the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute um, over the last few years, and uh, also to know and learn from a lot of people that I see on this uh, on this uh, webinar or this meeting as well. So uh, thank you for that. For me, I mean, in some ways I come fairly late uh, to doing this work. I mean, I knew as a very young child, um, shortly after 1967, um, that, uh, that uh, there were questions related to uh, Palestine, uh, particular because I grew up in the United Church, which of course was the largest Protestant church um, at that time. And um, at that time, uh, Reverend Dr. Al Forrest, who uh, was the uh, editor of uh, the national magazine, The Observer, which was in like lots of homes across the country, um, was taking strongly um, around the rights of refugees, but also just in those early days after the occupation. So I kind of understood that, but then I got busy with my career and raising a family. I uh, worked with the Ontario government, was fairly senior um, in Ministry of Agriculture and Food and Municipal Affairs. So went on with my life and just thought things were happening that were um, standing up against the wall being built in Palestine and other things sort of through the, you know, through the years following the two intifadas. And in 2014, uh, sort of on the other side of working for the Ontario government, um, I was uh, in the process of being ordained as a United Church minister and had the opportunity as part of that process to uh, go and be a human rights observer or an ecumenical accompanier in uh, Palestine. It was the summer of 2014, just as the uh, the bombs were being dropped on Gaza that summer. Um, I was up in the area of, uh, of Jeus near Kakilia and Tolkaram, but I really did get to see um, all of our occupied West Bank and a good part of uh, 48 Israel during my time there. I realized the United Church probably wasn't fully my answer, although I didn't know that at the time, but I was told not to use the word apartheid and not to use the word NAPCA unless I also said independent stay um, in reference to Israel. So um, some of my own understanding, I guess, was unfolding, but I had gone to Palestine not because I was going to stand necessarily and help Palestinians, but because I felt that as a Canadian, I needed to be able to uh, learn and come back and do my work in Canada. So um, one thing led to another. I was ordained. I didn't speak much about Palestine, but after I left the church up in Sault Ste. Marie, um, I was uh, I was called in uh, for a chat, and that chat led to basically a review, something that was outside the church's own policy, because that can only really happen if there's issues brought forward by a congregation of the presbytery, which there were not. And it became clear it was very much about Palestine, even though I had done very little other than just mention uh, very briefly um, uh, John Barrett's visit um, and suggested it, uh, it was a time that he got a few eggs and shoes thrown at him in Ramallah. Um, and uh, that uh, I just suggested uh, that he uh, maybe could have gone on up the road to Nablus to Siprat, um, which is uh, modern day Nablus, the well of Jacob with the Samaritan and Jesus had met that story and uh, and sat down with some Samaritans and uh, some Palestinians and had a conversation. And that was enough to uh, sort of say, well, I was too, uh, too Palestinian, pro-Palestinian, I suppose. So anyway, that led to a human rights complaint that's still before the Human Rights uh, Tribunal um, six years later. 
um, related to my creed of being anti-Zionist. Um, so one thing led to another, and um, I just decided if this is what was required, I would put a lot of my energy into Palestine. So very briefly, I guess for the first year or two, 2016, 2017, I was back in Toronto uh, uh, being your grandmother and uh, doing other things. And I just really tried to get to build relationships, get to know people. Beit Satoon was uh, still open. So I had the chance to um, really meet activists from uh, the Palestinian diaspora and the solidarity community, but also also broader communities of, of social justice as well, and just get to know people and try to understand and build trust. And so that really was what happened. And then in uh, 2017, uh, Jonathan Katab had come to Toronto, was uh, doing a visiting scholarship at uh, Osgoode Law School and didn't have any courses to teach for some reason and was looking for things to do. So um, we just started getting- he's, he's the founder of Al Haq, a very important yes, yes. human rights group. Yeah, thank you for that. So yeah, he's a fairly well known international human rights law lawyer, the founder of Al Haq or co-founder of Al Haq. And so we just started doing quite a few um, meetings, both in Ottawa with politicians, but also speaking engagements as well. And that's what led to Just Peace Advocates. A year later, we formed a, a few of us got together, including Palestinian diaspora and, uh, and others, and uh, formed Just Peace Advocates with the thought of really being very much like a Palestine legal here in Canada and developing those sorts of resources and networks, which we have done. We could talk more or less about that. But that was sort of our initial work. But as we develop partnerships, as we work with different groups, then you now the campaigns started to come together. Also, during that time in 2016, um, groups of us from across the country had gotten together to form the Canadian BDS coalition. It originally came out of a boycott, a soda stream boycott that the United Church had uh, brought some groups together for, but many of those groups uh, really believed in the full BDS call, the right of return, um, and saying the word apartheid out loud. And so that group sort of became um, our network became basically about 20 to 25 groups over the, these years since 2016 that really support, you know, that full, uh, full package of uh, uh, BDS related to right of return, equal rights, as well as ending the occupation. So with that, campaigns started to emerge and we had the first couple of victories, including uh, an Air Canada contract with Israeli aerospace industries being cancelled. Um, Again, just based on, you know, sort of tenacity and reaching out and letter writing and working with the unions and that kind of thing. And so from those things, other things sort of built to things like uh, making enough noise that the Raptors didn't go to uh, Israel after they, uh, they won the championship. So, you know, campaigns like that. So that was kind of the history that kind of got me to, uh, to the place of getting Just Peace Advocates going in 2018, and then the campaigns that have followed since then. And, and uh, JPA has, you know, is a important uh, force, is certainly in Palestine solidarity, and I think more, more generally, if people aren't on the list, it's a, Karen runs a very big list that, a you know, very active oriented uh, list that people uh, uh, should, should get on to, and also uh, a very important, uh, media list uh, for, for groups that, that supports lots of, uh, not just Palestine related, but, um, uh, you know, social justice, international uh, f f policy focused, uh, you know, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute and, and, and others uh, often uh, use, and she's uh, um, helps to send that out. And we know well, while the media usually ignores what's on the press releases, uh, every so often they do uh, when they when they f find some way to like slander or attack attack it, all of a sudden uh, they do uh, get in touch. So we know they're getting the emails, even if they usually usually ignore them. Uh, but uh, but uh, so I, I just thought I'd talk about you know a few uh, campaigns maybe uh, that um, that you're involved with right now. There's the recent one with uh, uh, WSB Global around the light rail in East Jerusalem. And uh, do you want to talk just uh, briefly about that? 
Sure. So um, WSP is an engineering uh, company that's headquartered in Montreal, a very large transnational company uh, that has offices pretty much everywhere in Canada. They only you know, do all the sort of local engineering at the municipal level, um, as well as lots of provincial and federal contracts and such, and are all over the world. So you can just sort of Google WSP and uh, see who they are. Um, a couple of years before the UN database came out, and for those who might not know, basically that came out of um, a resolution with the Human Rights uh, Committee at the UN in, I don't know, maybe 2016 to develop a list of companies that uh, are in the settlements that would be deemed by the UN to be companies that should be uh, divested from or uh, boycotted. Um, that list was a couple of years before it actually became public, not the full list, but information about it. And there were to be two companies from Canada. But when the list actually was revealed, there were no companies from Canada. We figured probably it was Bombardier and WSP based on research done by other groups, including Who Profits, which is an Israeli uh, research uh, organization that looks at these things and verifies them. So, um, there had been a few letters and things written from El Haq, uh, the human rights organization in Palestine, and Just Peace Advocates to WSP, um, asking them about their involvement and such. We, of course, never got responses. They were fairly formal letters delivered in fairly formal ways. So um, the work began to basically develop a submission that would go into the United Nations to have consideration to put um, WSP onto the uh, database. That database is to be updated by the UN every year, but they have not kept their commitment to do that. Um, another company uh, that goes under the name of CAF um, that's in Spain has also had a submission that was put in um, a year and a half or so ago as well. So um, the one to the WSP um, just went in with uh, this current uh, uh, 51st session of the Human Rights uh, Committee. Um, it has been received, we're told it was well received and they will investigate and look into it. Um, we've had good response about 40 organizations across Canada. Uh, well over 100 internationally, many organizations that are registered uh, as ECOSOC, which is sort of a formal status with the UN, and lots of activists and, uh, and lots of other uh, named people like Noam Chomsky and Roger Waters and, and others that have, uh, you know, signed on to that, and the three, most recent three uh, former rapporteurs. So we, we've got that sort of in place. I think there'll be more local campaigns coming out in Montreal and across Canada um, on this, probably more action-oriented. Um, and we also also put a quite a focus on both the Quebec and the Canada pension plan. Um, for a few years, we've been focusing on the Canada pension plan because it has a number of companies that are on the UN list, but also has WSP. In fact, at a point it actually had major, more than 50% of the shares, Canadian shares of our Canadian uh, public pension um, are in WSP. And similar, the Quebec pension plan, it, it has all of those same companies. It also has Elbit and uh, Alliance, Global Alliance, or Alliance Global, I guess it's called, that um, owns for, uh, G4S as well in its portfolio. So we've started letter writing on both of those and, uh, and also have um, reached out to, uh, to both of the pension boards. The, the Canada Pension Board had said they were reviewing it in uh, the spring of 2020 and looking at the situation, but then they've gone quiet. So um, again, some more actions would be great if people are in Toronto or Montreal and want to get out on the street, uh, um, those kinds of things just to draw attention. But um, in the meantime, the Canada Pension Plan is doing their every second year, they do stakeholder meetings and those are happening starting tomorrow in Vancouver and there will be a presence from some of our colleagues and comrades in Vancouver and uh, it'll work its way across the country to uh, St. John's, Newfoundland and we've got people lined up to uh, go to those meetings and ask questions and provide information and that kind of thing. And the specific questions that you're going to be pushing people to ask are? 
are, yeah, about the investments from the Palestine question, uh, their investments in basically war crimes, I can word it a bit softer than that if they want, but the companies that are on the UN database, WSP, where they're at with the review. But there's also questions coming from World Beyond War related to just the general weapons manufacturing, uh, some of our environmental um, you know, partners are asking questions related to fossil fuels and gas, the pipelines. Um, so we've worked very intersectionally. And I mean, that's been another part of bringing some of these kinds of campaigns together is to really reach out as broadly as we can, but not allow sort of room for PAP. Like we can't have progressives except Palestine working with us. But uh, if you can at least uh, sort of have that conversation, we can certainly work with the, the Mining Injustice and Mining Watch Canada and, you know, organizations uh, from a fairly large spectrum, some of them larger NGOs and some of them just grassroots, you know, very much local groups. So that's, um, it's sometimes hard to find common ground, but it's really been important to do that work uh, as well, especially in things like the pension plans or other campaigns we're working on. And and the drone campaign as well, Canada purchasing five up to $5 billion worth of drones. Yes, drones, um, drones for sure. Um, we did start before the election last year with the Canadian BDS coalition to um, write to the Canadian government and then during the election and, and then after related to drones because Israeli Aerospace Industries is one of the companies that's in one of two consortiums that are in a short list. There's sort of two contenders. But more recently, uh, you know, we've been able to reach out with the World Beyond War and many other groups, including civil liberties and, and others um, for a broader campaign, which we launched with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute a couple of weeks ago on a, a webinar and, and a letter writing that started. And now we're looking at things like going to the UN. Uh, Canada comes up next year to be reviewed for our human rights record at the UN. That happens every few years. Um, under a periodic review. So we will be working hopefully with some other legal groups and other groups um, on the drones and some other things in that regard as well. Also, um, I see a question in here, Eve, around the No Way to Treat a Child campaign, and I certainly could speak to that if uh, you yeah. would like. Um, yeah, so in 2017, Manira Kitmito, who uh, a Palestinian from Oakville and I, uh, decided we would do something about, uh, about children. So we work with DCI Palestine, the Defense for Children International Palestine, um, both uh, Brad Parker in uh, the US, but also the folks in Ramallah, the General Secretary in Ramallah, to bring that campaign to Canada. We did launch it officially. I think there were about 40 organizations that signed in. There was, I don't know, about 25 MPs that actually did sign a letter, although the letter didn't go as far as it should. I think maybe Elizabeth May and a couple others kind of pulled back on it at a point so it didn't kind of get going. Um, so that campaign is still kind of there. Um, it's certainly there for the US. Uh, we had asked if we could ramp it up a bit more here in Canada this year, and the thought is it would be more next year. So some, I know there's a few uh, women uh, from within IJV, Independent Jewish Voices and others that we're gonna be doing some other things. For Just Peace Advocates, we've tended to, um, as a result to do work related to children, both for Kashmir and Palestine that are in prisons, because it's essentially the, the same situation. Uh, we do a fair amount of work for uh, regard to Kashmir as well. It's something people don't know as much about, but um, for sure. Um, but certainly the webinars, the other information, um, the United Church, uh, is a partner um, with BCBI and you can uh, get I think a tax receipt if you go onto the United Church website and figure out how to do that you can actually donate to get a tax receipt for uh, uh, donating to Defense for Children International Palestine um, yeah um, yeah so uh, you know it is it's an important program but there are other ways of doing that work uh, with Adamir and El Haq and some of the other groups. Uh, we also did put a, a petition uh, in at least one, one very recently, uh, related to children in the military. Selma Zayad, a liberal, uh, sponsored that just post-election. Um, 
let me can post the link if we get to it, but the liberal government's response was so pathetic. It was just so pathetic. You know, we care about Palestinian children and that was about all, even though it was a liberal MP who had sponsored it. So, yeah. So uh, I'll open it up to uh, to questions or comments, uh, you know, about to, to Karen, to me, just people have general comments. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm running into my, uh, I think my... I'm the only one that has my hand up at the moment. Oh, go, go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm not seeing it, but go oh, ahead. <laughs> out. Well, I'm wondering if both of you could help me. I, I have a problem. I'm a longtime supporter of BDS, but at the same time, you know, I live in the U.S. and I'm strongly involved in campaigns against sanctions, against U.S. sanctions around the world, Western sanctions, which are so destructive in so many countries. And I sometimes have a hard time trying to, if someone says to me, well, how can you support BDS if you're opposed to sanctions? And, you know, I come up with a weak argument. Well, it's the Palestinians themselves asking for this, but it doesn't really work because you could say the MEK from Iran are asking for sanctions on Iran. I'm, I'm just wondering if you could think of, help me think through a coherent, compelling argument for why these are not contradictory or inconsistent views that I have. I can start and you jump in. Uh, Just Peace Advocates is a member of uh, Sanction Kills, um, and we have talked about doing a bit more better work uh, in a kind of coalition or partnership way here in Canada around, around uh, no sanctions. I, the way we would describe it, and I'm not sure it's the best, but it's just, you know, where there are imperial powers. So in the case of Palestine and, and in the case of Kashmir, one might make the same argument, I suppose, for the West Sahara. I'm more focused on Palestine and Kashmir, therefore Israel and India. Um, sanctions are fine and in fact are required under Canada's own law because there's this, I know you're saying you're from the US, but we have the Special Economic mm -hmm. Measures Act that does require sanctions and it requires sanctions uh, for countries that have systemic human rights violations, which is pretty hard to say Israel and India do not have. So um, in that sense, um, yeah, I mean, it, you have to be careful with the language because it is really hard and people do, you know, struggle with that. So I, I really appreciate you raising that point, but uh, we're pretty clear in our own minds where those sanctions do fit in, uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, Israel and, and in our case, India as well related to Kashmir. And, and I believe that that goes to the question of international law with regards to the Security Council having, uh, you know, say, said that <clears throat> Israel's violating international law by by its occupation of the West Bank and therefore being, while the sanctions are not coming from the, I'm not, I don't know the, the sort of intricacies of this, but the sanctions are not obviously coming from, from the Security Council, but that they've opened the window to sanctioning. Um, I, I have to say that like Canadian sanctions, uh, Canada used to have uh, legislation that or still, sorry, still has legislation that says any sanctions that are adopted by Security Council, they automatically become uh, Canadian sanctions, right? That Canada automatically adopts that. And, and that's the sort of legalistic uh, understanding of, of, of sanctions. In recent years, they've they've vastly increased the sort of legislation around the sanctions question. From a practical standpoint, right, at the level of like state sanction, I don't personally believe that it's plausible to, that Canada is ever going to be in a position of sanctioning Israel uh, without massive concessions by Israel. Right. Like I, 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 I personally am a little, I have a, I have a, ambivalence towards the sanctioning idea uh, with regards not, not uh, with Canada Israel because I, I think that much of the struggle on Palestine is just about upholding Canadian law right there's a whole bunch of ways like the Foreign Enlistment Act all these charities that 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 support uh, uh, settlement projects that are support the Israeli military that they should lose their charitable status because Canadian char charity law says that's that's you know you're not allowed to do that and be a registered charity. Even when it comes to Canada sending weapons to Israel, Canada's uh, uh, laws around uh, export controls around weapons, 
I, my reading of it, I not you know the specifics that well, but like my understanding of that should should preclude Israel receiving weapons. So there's a whole bunch of ways in which if you just simply uphold Canadian law, and, and I, I know Karen can go further with some of this stuff because we're actually having this discussion, a variation of this discussion not that long ago. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways in which you can you can just structure the demands as upholding Canadian law. And and so you don't even have to get to the point of like the state sanction like we had with South Africa. In South Africa, we actually had, you know, uh, um, that you couldn't trade with South Africa, right? They still, there was all kinds of ways which was bypassed, but you that, that was ostensibly what the Canadian government, in, in, with regards to Israel, we, we have like over a quarter billion dollars being raised every year from registered charities that are being subsidized by Canadian taxpayers being sent to projects in Israel. If you were to take the BDS call at its full, all of that should be gone, right? All of that should be illegal. In the case, my understanding is as, as applied to South Africa, that was illegal with South Africa to, for a Canadian charity to like raise money for a South African hospital, that was illegal, right? During, during the sanctions period. That's, and I, I get, I, I, if someone else on the, you know, has more information on that than, than I, then, you know, jump in. But, and I don't even not exactly know how that was applied. So, so, so to me, you know, I, I said, I think I said this in a previous thing to me, the BDS call, the, the element that I think is really, really important. I'm talking about Canada. I'm not talking about Ireland and I'm not talking about other places in the world where I think sanctions and boy, the boycott has, is much more of a, a practical uh, political tool in the here and now, but in Canada and, and quite frankly, the US, it, it, to, 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 um, <clears throat> to, to me, that, that, um, that campaign is, is uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's steps removed from the, from the political uh, 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 context that we're in. Um, so, so yes, I think that, you know, I, like I, I, oh, sorry. So with regards to BDS, should I say, so with regards to BDS, like what, what I think what the BDS movement has done so well is, is to discredit Zionism, right? To, to say, this is, didn't just start in 67. The whole thing's been a colonial imperial project from the get go. It's inherently racist. It's inherently violent. It's inherently colonial, et cetera, et cetera. To me at a practical tactical level, I'm not, convinced that the BDS structure necessarily makes uh, the most sense in the North American context. I think there are some that work like the, the Air Canada, like very specific campaigns, pressuring on, on very, you know, even some of the artist campaigns, pressuring the artists not to play in Israel. That's a, just a place to exert some power. I don't think it has that much uh, educational value, but I think as, you know, exert some power in some very specific domains. To me, the campaigns that are like more educationally and and ultimately politically uh, more uh, fruitful are the things on like the foreign enlistment, are the things on these charities that are that are breaking the law by being you know tax subsidized charities that are supporting the Israeli military, and that and those are not those are not strictly BDS campaigns. Um, anyway, so that's a sort of a roundabout kind of answer to some of that. And, and, I'm, and I'm happy to hear if any people have a you know a disagreement or, or you Karen, when well, you want to jump in with some some more details on you know just even upholding Canadian law and how other domains could be included with within the realm of upholding Canadian law. Uh, but or yeah, anyone else? But I, I again, I apologize. I'm not seeing the hands. I don't know what happened again. I, I, I think Yuri's hands up. Go ahead, go ahead, Yuri. Go. <laughs> Uh, my question to Karen is: uh, You mentioned that the uh, that, that 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 your former church, the United Church, wasn't so on board with uh, speaking out against what Israel is doing in Palestine. But then I'm just curious, since since a lot of churches, unfortunately, are complicit in the uh, dispossession of Palestinians. I know that the Christian rights, and then of course there's Christian Zionism. A lot of a lot of them are very powerful in in upholding, you know, settler colonialism in Palestine. Uh, but I'm curious, uh, are the Quakers and the Unitarian Church, are they, uh, are, are, are they a, uh, a, a progressive left-leaning uh, 
institution, church-wise, that people can engage with in terms of, uh, yeah, in, in, in terms of campaigning for justice for the Palestinians? Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly the United Church of Canada is seen as probably one of, you know, is progressive church and probably is as good and better on Palestine than pretty much any other organization. I just use that example that the word apartheid still cannot be said out loud. I can put a link in to uh, show you some of the convoluted actions that went through at the General Council this past year. There was an article that uh, I had published as well that uh, talked to, to that. Um, but that doesn't say there aren't some good things. I mean, as I say, they collect money for Defense for Children International. I think, you know, 10 or $20,000 a year does go to uh, that program and other you know other things they did send me and other people as ecumenical accompaniers um yeah the quakers again i mean i am not able to probably speak but through the local meet monthly meetings there's other people i think that are on this call that could i mean have done you know some excellent work and have a strong solidarity uh, aspect one of the one of uh, their uh, people People are uh, very involved in our Canada Pension Plan campaign. Uh, the Unitarians, of course, are not uh, considered sort of a Christian church, but again, we um, actually, the Unitarian, the social justice uh, uh, grouping of the Unitarians is one of the members of the Canadian BDS coalition. Um, the Canadian Council of Churches, which represents almost all the churches in uh, in Canada, and, and even more than with the World Council of Churches, it includes both Reformed and Catholic and Orthodox. So it, you know, it's been there since mm -hmm. right after the Second World War. I mean, the, the heads, the administrative heads, um, they do know, they do understand. We, you know, had meetings with them. Uh, you know, they one of them worked with Oxfam, another did a lot of training of people who've gone to Palestine, but the, the organization themselves uh, will not go there. They will not go there on Palestine. They used to. If you go back through the archives, that'd be a separate webinar. But um, when you go back through the archives and go back into those years in the 70s, when uh, the pro-Israel lobby was working hard to shut down the United Church and, um, and the Canadian Council of Churches, and they worked very hard. Um, it was around things like uh, motions to uh, to uh, stop selling Israeli uh, bonds and to stop the JNF, some of the same things we're doing now, 50, 60 years later, um, that, you know, things went very silent and got very quiet. And, you know, that whole story can be found in in uh, in the church archives and, and in the Ontario Jewish archives as well. Um, so there are places and niches locally you can find within congregations or within in groupings within those congregations that are trying to make a difference within their church and outside. I don't know if that helps you right now. Interesting. That's something called Shake has his hands up. Yeah, right. Hey, you're Jake. Muted. Jake Javanshir, you're muted, I think. No, no I'm not muted. I, oh, okay. Uh, I just want to say a couple of words about the BDS that if uh, you brought it on. And first also to thank you and to thank uh, Karen. Now, in regard to the BDS, although it has a lot of bad connotations at the moment because the way the Jewish lobby and Israel and supporters of uh, the politicians who support Israel, they're going after it like no tomorrow because it is, in a way, might be later on more effective. And this is one tool that it's uh, uh, lawful, Nonviolent, recognized internationally, and it's absolutely. I think it's good to use it, uh, and it will. We just have to keep on it, keep on at it. Everybody to get more momentum. Yesterday there were two webinars, separate ones. One of them, Gideon Levy, and the other one with Miko Pellet among the audience. Both of them stressed especially Gideon Levy and Mirko Pellet, that BDS, it's basically the only game in town, that this is the tool that we have that we can go after the after Israel and its supporters. And there's nothing for us to be afraid, although yes, they're going after us, but they said that it's about time that we stand up and push, not to try to apologize all the time, that's the wrong thing to do and push and push and push. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, whole, I wholeheartedly agree. I just, I, I guess the distinction I would make here is between, okay, so in Ireland, I think it makes sense. I don't know that much about Ireland's connection to Palestinian dispossession, but the broad sense of what I understand, it makes sense to try to boycott Israeli oranges. In Canada, like I, I don't, I don't, I don't oppose efforts to boycott Israeli oranges coming into Canada. I don't, I don't oppose that at all. I just don't think that it would, it makes sense to prioritize that campaign when we have a situation where you have like charities that are probably breaking the law. They're sending like tens of millions of dollars a year to Israel subsidized by the Canadian taxpayer, right? And and like and 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 I, and I and and in some theoretical way, it's easier to 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 challenge some Israeli oranges coming into Canada. But but it's not even that is not even necessarily the case. Like 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 I think that we've we've seen that that with some of the charities, um, the 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 this one that just noticed uh, a week or two ago, um, the. Uh, Ariel, I think it's the Canadian Friends of Ariel University. It, 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 is that correct? Aaron, that was the one, right? They, we just noticed uh, a week or two ago that they appear to have lost their charitable status. Okay, they have a notice on the website saying that that they, due to Canada Revenue Agency uh, uh, implication, we can no longer uh, provide tax receipts, whatever. I don't, I don't know this, but I know that I mentioned that group twice in articles last year, just like sort of mention a paragraph that, you know, it's operating in a settlement and that's officially against what Canadian tax law is or Canada Revenue, Canada Revenue Agency rules are supposed to say that, that the, you can't be supporting the settlements. And, and now it appears it's, it's, it's charitable status has been taken away. Now, it maybe has nothing to do with mentioning it in two articles. Maybe it had to do with something, you know, completely different. But like, and I don't think that this, this specific charity was raising that much money. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a powerful charity like the Jewish National Fund of Canada is. But, you know, if that's what actually happened, that they lost the charitable status by just like mentioning it a couple of times. And, and I mean, that's like actually, that's, you know, of some consequence to so 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 to so, so to me, I guess what I would essentially say is that the BDS formulation underplays how complicit Canada is in Palestinian dispossession. It underplays just how involved Canada is and has been historically and is today in propping up Zionism, in propping up Israeli military, on and on and on. Right. And so and so again, I completely support the sort of ideological framing, right, of BDS is, you know, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, we're going to clear this is a, 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 you know, colonial, imperial, racist endeavor, and, and it deserves international, uh, uh, certainly international solidarity, and it deserves like, you know, aggressive sanction, using the word sanction in its loosest sense. I mean, I, in all, in all of its senses, should I say, uh, and, and, but but th but then when you break that down into a tactical level within the Canadian political culture, like I I completely believe that all the, I, I think all these charities that raise more than a quarter billion dollars a year in this country to send to Isra Israeli hospitals and uh, universities and the Israeli military and all, all that should be shut down. I completely agree. I, I think their charitable well I I would say I, I I believe their charitable status should all be eliminated and and that yeah and that you can make a strong case that they all should be just shut down. But like, I, I think that like we're, I think sometimes in the BDS movement, we're taking on campaigns that take us a little bit away from just how complicit Canada is. And also they, they and, and, and one, of the, one of the issues in that is that I think that like the, the, the Zionist propaganda frames like victimhood and frames like Israel being singled out, right? That's a really important, a uh, uh, variable in their propaganda. And Israel is being singled out. It's just from the other direction. It's singled out and they're allowed to openly violate the Foreign Enlistment Act. They're allowed to openly violate Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency rules, 
right? And so, and so from an ideological ca perspective, campaigning on things that, 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 that highlight that, while if they're successful, the consequences for Israel are actually much greater than stopping uh, uh, um, Israeli uh, oranges coming into Canada. That to me is where we want to put more of more of our attention, and and I and I and I'll go further with that. Like you know, this is you know the Sorel case, what we just had developed. This is this is, you know we haven't shut down Sorel yet. That's clear. You know that's obviously the goal is to shut the organization down. But but just the fact that it's going to be raised in a, in a court of law and they're going to have to defend themselves is a big step forward. And and I think just in general the Foreign Enlistment Act campaign that's been going on has made the pro-Israel groups go, go silent. I mean, they're still doing their enlistment and their support, but they've had to go way more quiet, do it way less publicly, which is, which is you know, consequent. It might mean that like, you know, four less Torontonians go join the Israeli military every year. You know, what is that in the big picture? You know, I don't know, but it, it's something. And it's certainly, you know, compared to, you know, not having Israeli oranges come into Canada, uh, I would say as much consequence in beyond having, you know, important, ideological. So, so I think that they're just, they're just some, the, and, and this was, you know, when I saw Barghouti speak in, in Montreal in uh, 2006, 2007, just after the, the international campaign was, the, the call was put out of a BDS, he, he made the point that like campaigns and all this should be context specific, right? That you don't take, the campaign is not just like, you know, what, what makes sense in Ireland or what makes sense in Jordan isn't the same in Canada or in the US, right? And so, and so that like, you know, yes, it's all happening as part of this international movement to, you know, support uh, the, the, you know, Israel, uh, Palestinian civil society's call and, you know, things like that. But, but when you get down into the sort of nitty gritty of how you apply that, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think Sija, we should, we should, set, we should shut down Sija, right? <laughs> we should, you know, United Jewish Appeal that sends uh, tens of millions of dollars to Israel every year. I mean, should, should we be calling for shutting down Yuja? Yeah, I mean, I'm, in one sense, I'm, you know, I'm, you're certainly not going to, you know, I'm not going to be holding that campaign back. Um, but, but we just, I think we have to sort of be, um, yeah, I, I guess a little bit, um, uh clear in in how, what campaigns can exert power and have like a you know a specific victory i think some of the the cultural boycott stuff has shown success on that front i think there are some of the other campaigns that have been developed in canada around bds that maybe aren't as uh, they need to be a bit more targeted uh for the possibility of success within this incredibly anti-palestinian pro-zionist political culture that we that we operate in. Thank you very much for your clarification. I agree to many of the points you made. And I mean, I think that's one thing with the Canadian BDS coalition, like, I mean, Puma, you know, I mean, Puma, you know, don't wear Puma running shoes because of their being uh, a sponsor of uh, settlement clubs but you know for us what we've worked on more specifically is there is a, a executive here in Canada related to that works for Puma so we focused on the Canadian executives so I think also the other thing is to try to think about on some of the more broader global campaigns that could come from the BNC or other places like how to make those very specific to our our own context and then they appeal to different people I mean that may get someone else's interest uh, in a different way so um, but uh, so much agree with Eve I mean that's why the, the United Nations Security Council campaign was uh, so important you know uh, we started to do some work on it in 2018 before or 17 before uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute was in place and before Just Peace Advocates were in place we did that with Friends of Sabeel so there's a an, or, uh, Canadian Friends of Sabeel so there's an example of a church related organization it was Robert Astley and we sort of put the Canadian government on notice that if they didn't change their voting record and do better the next year, that we'd be, uh, you know, we'd be forced to reckon with related to uh, their bid for the United Nations Security Council. So we'd set that stage and then uh, the other pieces came together in the broader piece with Canadian Foreign Policy Institute in terms of broader foreign policy, but also allowed us to really use the, uh, the specifics related to Palestine, which uh, spoke 
spoke loudly because they're they're very clear and that that voting record it hasn't changed i did some further analysis right back to 48 and uh, other than uh, some um, warm warm fuzzy uh, uh voting around Oslo time i mean essentially we've been anti uh, anti palestinian in our vote right from the beginning of partition plan so uh, that you know was an important campaign because it was very canadian specific and yet it reached out to every country in the world right because of how we reached out to Are there any other comments or questions? If there are, go ahead. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. Eve, uh, Eve, it sounds as if uh, you're, uh, it sounds as if you're sort of saying a version of what Professor Noam Chomsky uh, said when he was uh, asked about his position on BDS. And he thought that's that, and well, I, I, I can't really remember what, what 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 Chomsky said, but he was more in favor of of, of BDS activists focusing specifically on on, uh, on 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 trying to stop arms trade to uh, Israel and uh, and uh, and accepting stuff that are coming from illegal settlements. Is yeah. that sort of what you're trying to say when it comes no, to? No, no, I, I would have a distinction with what what Chunk said. I, first of all. The, my most okay. important distinction would be that I think Chomsky uh, downplays the that this is just an imperial colonial project from get go. He doesn't talk about the Nakba, uh, for instance, as much as it, I think it should be and, and stuff like that. So, oh, so okay. So he he puts forward. I'm not putting forward, you know, two state solution. I'm not. I'm not. That's not what I'm. I'm not. You know, I I, I I'm I'm agnostic. Effect in effect. On 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 that question, um, but but uh, so so that's that would be one part. I'm not I'm not like I, I so I I think that we should use in part what I'm saying is I think we should use the law as it exists within Canada to assert power on this question. You know, on, on occasion, not only, but I think there's a lot of areas in which, you know, like the Foreign Enlistment Act has really terrible roots to it, right? The Foreign Enlistment Act was stopped. To, it, well, part of the Foreign Enlistment Act was set up. There was an, actually an earlier version of Canada's Foreign Enlistment Act, but the, the how it became uh, operable was in 36 to stop Canadians from fighting in the Spanish Civil War against Franco's fascists. So that's not, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not, in that sense, I don't, I don't love it. It's actually quite a nationalistic uh, thing. But in this case, it, it, it's an, it offers an opportunity to disrupt this, enlistment and support assistance to the Israeli military. And so therefore we should, you know, where that's applicable. Same thing with the Canada Revenue Agency rules. I don't think, I don't think though, I think, I think all like the charities question is an easy one for me. I think the whole, like the whole business of, of charitable status should basically be eliminated, right? It, effectively what charitable status does is it's a bias towards wealthy people and getting tax receipts when they donate, right? So this is something like across the board, the, that whole, direction of political things I don't think is a good thing, right? So to be opposed to charities and charitable status is a pretty easy one. But but then in the case of Israel, we have some like, you know, the Canada Revenue Agency rules say you can't support another country's military. Very clearly. That's not, not at all ambiguous. It's absolutely clear cut. You cannot support another country's military. There's a whole bunch of Canadian charities that quite clearly are supporting the Israeli military. So let's let's prod at that, right? And, and there already is the Canada Zionist Cultural Association, the same lawyer that that is uh, pushing the, that's got the the Sarel case. He he also is, you know, uh, uh, helped in putting towards a, a challenge of Can Canadian Zionist Cultural Association's charitable status due to its support for the Israeli military. So, so um, and, and likewise, the Canada Revenue Agency says that that um, that uh, you, you, the, Canada, the Canadian government considers uh, s projects that support settlements as contravening international law, and therefore, you as a Canadian charity, you can't get a subsidy by the government and support projects supporting uh, settlements. So I'm not I'm not coming at this. I'm coming at this more from a Canadian legalistic standpoint rather than like a sort of, again, I, I repeat, I, I think even like, I think even the anti-Zionist movement is too soft for the most part on, on Zionism. I don't like people who say that Zionism is a reaction to the, you know, the, the, the European anti-Semitism. 
I don't agree with, I mean, it partly it clearly was a reaction to late 1800s European anti-Semitism, but it's better understood as a coming out of late 1800s imperialism, uh, the scramble for Africa, uh, nationalist ideologies that were taking root in Europe and the Christian Zionism that comes out of the Protestant Reformation, right? European anti-Semitism just doesn't just begin in the late 1800s. There's like histories of European anti-Semitism on many different occasions. How, how that takes on an imperial nationalistic uh, political project that is Zionism, uh, that's tied to the, these ideologies, again, like the scramble for Africa, right? So, so and I think, I think, I think the, that much of the anti-Zionist movement doesn't root, root, you know, that root understanding Zionism enough in, 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 the, in, the, in those other ideologies that we would usually reject. Uh, um, so, 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 uh, so yeah. Some of us are even too afraid to even, uh, to even describe ourselves as anti-Zionists. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so anyways, that, that, that's like, I'm, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I understand, I understand Chomsky's position to a certain extent. I, I haven't delved into it in deep, deep detail, but I generally understand his position. I don't a agree with that formulation of like, he'll basically, I'll only support something that's, you know, BDS if it's BDS targeted at you know the illegal occupation in the West Bank, uh, that's not the position I'm I'm articulating. Uh, um, it's a you know it's mostly it's more tactical, right? It's 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 it's, it's tactical position. It's not like a sort of a, a you know moral position, but but the rooted in the political context that I understand uh, Canada to be on this question. Uh, so if there aren't if if there aren't any other uh, questions or comments, uh, I thank everyone for uh, uh, coming out and specifically uh, Karen and all the great work that uh, that Karen does uh, with uh, Just Peace uh, Advocates. Thanks everyone and uh, same place, same time uh, next week. Take care, have a good evening. Thanks, bye. Thank